How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 68th video on my channel, and today we're going to be looking at another of Felix Gautry's seminars titled Problems. This is quite a special video for me, since I've recently had my translation of a lecture accepted for publication in the journal Deleuze and Gautry Studies. When it comes to what it's about, Problems is quite heavy with content. Although, as the title suggests, Gautry's main focus lies on the relationship between problems and its concept of abstract machines, the seminar also explores things as diverse as the Sphinx riddles, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, and objects that move faster than light. Due to just how long it is as a result, I've decided to split this video up into two parts. Without further ado, let's get into it. Gautry begins with a premise that is simple enough. Problems exist. More than just illusions found in representation, they have a concrete reality that is encountered in everyday life as easily as physical objects. In addition, they behave a little like viruses, spreading and mutating all the time. Based on the dimensions of assemblages that we looked at in the last couple of episodes in this series, it's at this point that Gautry distinguishes between subjective, material, territorial, and machinic problems. On the first, he states, you can be a problem in your own right and have a totally problematic existence. This can be, in a clinical setting, the case with the melancholic, the schizophrenic. Fundamentally, problems on this level somehow concern the processes that make subjects, well, subjects. Anxiety and shyness, for example, can modify subjectivation to the extent that they affect a person's relationship with others. This is especially true concerning that Gautry's understanding of subjectivity often goes far beyond the individual, specifically linking to all sorts of heterogeneous elements. With this in mind, problems on the material level are the ones people actually have. Instead of being the problem yourself, you catch them. This tends to be what psychoanalysts and therapists focus on, much to Gautry's chagrin. Moving on to territorial problems, these are the ones that people make. Whilst with subjective ones, you're basically your own worst enemy, these kinds of problems are linked to phenomena like those of so-called problem children. In relation to the territorial context that envelops what's happening, certain things are seen to be at odds. It's for this reason that Gautry's example is of someone trailing off with the phrase in this institution. Unexistent is deemed problematic because it breaks with established norms. This brings us to the final dimension, the machinic. There's not much to say here, other than that it involves encountering a problem or catching it. Nothing more, nothing less. It's with this that he states, A zoology of problems needs to be established since problems have different consistencies due to the different assemblages that carry them. Moving away from the dimensions, he begins the zoology by offering the example of a poem. It's problematic insofar as it isn't given as a fact, but instead has to be assembled. All sorts of conditions are involved in posing it, from words themselves to rhythm. Moreover, the same poetic entity can take on different consistencies or forms, depending on whether it's spoken, read, sung, and so on and so on. However, where things get interesting is in the division between what Gautry calls persistence and transistence. The former involves things like spatiotemporal coordinates. How long does something last, how large is it spread, that sort of thing. Transistence, on the other hand, is something a bit different. It deals with the way that something cuts across those coordinates and transverses heterogeneous domains. Things with a strong transistence act as breaks, rearranging possibilities for the future and, retroactively, the past in the way that it is understood. Here, what is illustrated is the difference between early surrealism and a nondescript mathematical entity. For the former, even if, originally, it only had a tiny persistence concerning one time and one solitary place, it still had a massive transistence. It marked a rupture in art, literature, and, to an extent, psychology or psychoanalysis. With the nondescript mathematical entity, on the other hand, it may be taught in every classroom in the world, have an absurdly powerful persistence, yet still have a tiny transistence. As Gautry says, certain mathematical concepts simply can't be applied outside of a certain, delimited space. Comparing transistence and persistence side by side, we can say that the former defines the universe 
of abstract machines, which we'll explore soon, whilst the latter defines the universe of problems. On the second realm, Quadri poses an important question. Where do problems live? Problems live in assemblages under all kinds of forms. There are only problems linked to problematic assemblages, assemblages of valorization. Escaping this zoology, it's now time for an ethology. Problems, Gautry tells us, are gregarious beings. They tend to clump together and form colonies of sorts, which can be divided up into three main categories. Concretions, complexions, and problematic assemblages. Is the first of these that is represented in this diagram, being defined as organized around a black hole. This is a desire to not only not have problems, but to have never had problems, and to never have them again. In a way, it's a bit like Freud's death drive, a constant pressure to return to a state that lacks any disturbance whatsoever. Everything that is considered to cause problems is slowly extinguished through a sort of entropy, Compared to this, problematic complexions are quite a bit different. Instead of trying to destroy problems, assemblages actually carry them. However, this is caveated by the fact that said problems are essentially dominated by the assemblages in question. There is a steady state far enough away from the initial state of a black hole so as to avoid a collapse, but close enough that any recognition of the elephant in the room can cause a major cave-in. We find examples of this in family therapy, where it's necessary to construct a steady state of sorts through essentially hiding the problems at play, or else absorbing them into structures. Actually thinking about this state for too long, perhaps even acknowledging the reasons why family therapy was needed in the first place, can signal the death of the whole system. On this note, we get to problematic assemblages themselves. This time, the assemblages conditions no longer trump problematic productions. On the contrary, the problematic is what, in a way, carries the assemblage. These are far from equilibrium, meaning that they are liable to mutating in novel ways. This is where the concept of deterritorialization becomes important, a process that breaks down previous limits and organization and allows for creative change. Whilst in concretions, there's a catastrophic process of deterritorialization through rushing into it via black hole, and whilst in complexions it is minimized, problematic assemblages accept deterritorialization, making use of it to proliferate its problems. Because of their viral character, Quatri sees these as being able to get rid of the simple dualism of infrastructure and superstructure, or you could say that Baroque music stemmed from the emergence of capitalism, or vice versa. However, for now, his focus lies squarely on how problems can connect to each other. As you can see here, his example is of Oedipus and the Sphinx, with particular attention to the economies of narcissism and incest. Quattro explains that, whilst these exist in different territories or segments, they are articulated together through a certain kind of assemblage, like that of the Sphinx. In the reference myth, this acted as a kind of assemblage of passage, allowing access to a certain kind of sociality. If Oedipus responded correctly to his riddles, who would get to Thebes. With this in mind, it asked two questions. The first concerned filiation and the untangling of generations. This is the riddle, what walks on four feet in the morning, two in the afternoon, and three at night? The answer is a person, as a child, an adult, and someone elderly. The second, on the other hand, was more about what Gautry describes as parthenogenesis, a kind of asexual reproduction. Often forgotten, the Sphinx assemblage also asked Oedipus the riddle of who are those two sisters that engender each other. The answer to this is day and night. Through this idea of self-production, it is tied to the genesis of the image of the self. It's the generation of the individual. With the first riddle, it was a question of filiation, and thus psychoanalysts related it to the Oedipus complex. With the second, it was instead one of narcissism, in Gautry's own words. The Sphinx's problematic is precisely the question that knots these different assemblages together, allowing entry into a social operation, allowing the determination of prohibitions. It's on this note that we get to the fifth section of a seminar, how fast can a problem move? Here, 
Gautry seeks to develop the idea that problems move, at the limit, at the speed of light. This is fundamentally to set the groundwork for an exploration of abstract machines. However, we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. We just saw that there can be relationships between problems that exist in different territorialities or segments. Through these things assemblage, both the Oedipal and Narcissistic economy were able to have some degree of persistence, staying relatively stable. Now, Gautry wants to examine a similar phenomenon, but as it relates to capitalism in the framework of French historian Fernand Braudel. His goal is to find an explanation for why it only really took off in small entities, like Venice and Genoa, which Braudel characterizes as world economies. As you can see here, capitalism sort of emanated outwards from these, going from the world economies to provinces of benevolence, then the London area, and only then to larger things like France as a whole. Quartry theorizes that the reason lies in what he will call the speed of persistence, the way in which problems move. When they have a low speed of persistence, not much happens. They can't move fast enough to break out of the orbit of a steady state of complexions, or the black hole of concretions. However, once a certain threshold has been met, problems initiate the production of a far from equilibrium semitization. What this means is that they escape from simply being reliant on other machinisms and begin to do their own thing, mutating and spreading, again like a virus. However, Quatri is quick to stress that this isn't a one-off thing. There's always the risk of catastrophically falling into a black hole, or of being tempted to return to a steady state. As he himself puts it, There are dilations and contractions of this level of deterritorialization and rhythm, which incidentally is a general formula for crises. One of the main goals of schizoanalysis is essentially to work out where the thresholds that lead to far from equilibrium semiotics can be found. With this in mind, he explains his reasoning for insisting that problems can only move at the speed of light. Basically, they only exist within problematic fields, being substantial entities. They have to be territorialized in one way or another, holding a place somewhere in space and time. The question this leads to is of how problems can move from one place to another, even whilst being almost captivated by the assemblages they carry, or are carried by, them. It's here that he introduces abstract machines into the equation. These don't have to follow the axiom of relativity. They move at infinite speeds, an idea that Guattari develops at length in both schizoanalytic cartographies and, with Deleuze, what is philosophy. Using the term speed of transistence, as the abstract machinic equivalent to that of persistence, he explains that, on the flip side, it's possible for them to have no speed whatsoever. It is this that constitutes black holes. However, focusing on infinite speeds and in words that are quite reminiscent of Deleuze's own understanding of the actual and the virtual, Gautry states, Regardless of the speed of transfer of a problematic conditions, the abstract machinisms put into play always arrive earlier. Essentially, wherever a problem is posed, the solution already exists. He offers the example of transporting a set of conditions an infinite number of light shows into space. As long as they aren't actually sent, the real problem is imposed. However, the possibility of an answer, and of them having consistency, is always present. It might be helpful to have some context on what Gautry's are doing here. Basically, he's playing around with Henri Bergson's claim that the possible is only the real thrown or projected into the past. For him, abstract machines do this, being described as smoothing time. Just like writing Macbeth was possible for all of time after Shakespeare wrote it, as Gautry says, Once the conditions are there, the solutions will have already been there. The same problematic consistency as in the terrestrial conditions will be found. This constitutes an axiom in Gautry's system. As a result, he talks about there being a field of abstract machines that covers all problems, not unlike Deleuze with his continuum of multiplicities. Outside of all spatiotemporal coordinates, this field acts to not only provide the possibility of consistency, but, as you were saying, it also allows time itself to be reworked. Abstract machines can emerge basically anywhere and at any time, bringing with them a massive break in coordinates. It is this that is represented here, where the seeds of an abstract machinism takes a problematic field 
and essentially blows it up. In the process, all the expected trajectories and connections that can be foretold based on prior conditions fall apart. Instead of taking a stand against Bergson, Gualtieri is essentially trying to rehabilitate the possible by accepting the contradictions he originally outlined, something I might also make a video on at some point. Whatever the case, to paraphrase Gualtieri, there's always the opportunity for a rare or singular event to break through and introduce an anti-entropy, an innovative energy that shakes everything up. It's with this that we get to section 8, a field of fuzzy possibles. The titular concept here refers to all the events or singularities that we just mentioned as they exist on the level of abstract machines. They oppose problematic fields where the possible can essentially be determined in advance due to being composed of homogeneous and reproducible objects. Here, he makes his first distinction between the absolutely deterritorialized entities of abstract machinisms and the relatively deterritorialized entities of problematic ideologies. Whilst the former, as we've been exploring, has no place within space and time as such, the situation is a bit different for the latter. In his words, They are always caught up in the metabolism of assemblages. Their consistency of idealities is relative to territorialized fields, whilst abstract machines are not a part of possibilistic processes. It's possible to calculate these deterministic possibles, whereas fuzzy ones specifically act as a break within the fields of their probabilistic equivalents. As a small note, Gautry adds that this is why, in the last seminar titled Drive Black Hole, he replaced libido with the machining dimension of assemblages. Replacing a quantitative general economy based on some idea of vague energy, abstract machines are carriers of potentiality and all sorts of innovation. It's here that Gautry relates a debate he had with someone whose name is unfortunately unintelligible. Apparently, they brought up the fact that bifurcation diagrams, like the one shown here, do not have a transcendent existence. That's to say, they only exist through the fluctuating populations of singularities that they describe, mapping changes in qualitative or topological elements of a certain system. Instead of being reducible to simple interactions and interactions, Gottfried's friend argued that there is something else, what Manuel de Landa might describe under the category of emergent properties. Thinking about abstract machines and problems in terms of the former being possible and linked to these emergent properties, realizing problematic conditions reveals that the solutions were there all along. All that had to be done was the introduction of persistence into the equation. In other words, the introduction of substantial spatiotemporal elements. As Gottfried says about abstract machines themselves, they are transistent in the sense that they transist at an absolute speed, that they are everywhere at once, by being somewhere, nowhere, by always being able to be present absent. Coming now to the third to last section we'll be looking at today, titled Relative and Absolute Deterritorialization, it's time to return to the dimensions of the assemblage. For Guatri, components of far from equilibrium expression imply things like complexions and concretions on the level of content. They essentially take these and cause them to undergo what you will eventually call heterogenesis, with certain contents breaking off and beginning to do their own thing. In the context of a seminar, this takes the form of producing problems and making them proliferate. This is what it means to say something is happening. To give an example, Quadri presents the case of a young man who struggles with anxiety after being sexually harassed by another man. From a psychoanalytic perspective, it's the perfect case. It matches everything Freud said about repressed homosexuality and his early seduction theory. However, on further inspection, there's more to it. A psychoanalyst might focus on the fact that the patient himself has some queer fantasies. But, as Gottfried says, everyone does. Looking at his earlier taxonomy of problems, he says that it's obviously not a question of a territorial. Instead, to quote from the seminar again, The group of components of content points the finger at this entire dimension of expression. Here there is a being problem which is not reducible to the sum of territorialized problematics. It's a question of subjectivity. By focusing at all costs to pursue territorial elements, 
and then set up objectives for training the patient based on what they see as good, what they see as bad. When it comes to his fantasies, depending on the analyst, he might be pushed towards foreclosing them and hiding his identity, or conversely, pushed towards accepting them in a way that might be at odds with what's actually happening. Kortri cares more about components of expression and the mutations that occur on their level. Ending the section, he explains that these components can actually set themselves up within territories. To demonstrate this, Kortri offers an example that we looked at in the first episode of the series on the introduction to the seminar. That of a singer who lost her octaves following the death of her mother. Phrasing this in terms of the dimensions, a territory relationship changed for the singer, leading to a change in expression. Components of the former, playing the role of the latter, contracted. This mutation, like problematic idealities, can be placed under the banner of relative deterritorialization. This takes us to the penultimate section, which is more like an interlude than anything else. In from one intersection to another, Quatri simply remarks on the fact that, within the register of abstract machines, things either happen or they don't. With absolute deterritorializations or machinic effects, those ruptures in space and time, the focus is on singularities, points of bifurcation that can trigger a major far from equilibrium semitization, completely altering all the assemblages and problems involved. Nevertheless, they don't always appear. All sorts of things can make them lose their incisive character, stratifying the possibility of an abstract machinic surge. It's thus that, as Gautry himself puts it. Clearly, what counts is that problematic fields are explored, they exist. But what also counts is that the process of abstract machinic triggering exists. It happens, or it does not. It's with this that we arrive at the very last section we'll be examining. You don't bail out black holes. His concern here is on showing how to deal with singularities without falling into the black and white logic implied by psychoanalytic concepts like the opposition between the life drive, Eros, and the death drive, Thanatos. Essentially, abstract machines are not our saviors. There's no firm dualism between them and black holes, even if something to that effect is implied by Gautry's claim that the former function at infinite speeds and the latter at null ones. As you can see in this diagram, an abstract machine, with its field of fuzzy possibles, can easily collapse in on itself and form a black hole in its own right. This is something that, as Gautry regrettably states, is something that occurs quite often in clinical practice. Patients can seem to be doing well, branching out in all sorts of different directions, yet suddenly fall apart. Although he doesn't really say much about how this actually plays out here, to me, it seems that what he's getting at is the fact that deterritorialization is dangerous. Sure, a far from equilibrium semitization can massively help with symptoms, but as the name suggests, it also takes you away from stability. When pushed too far, everything can go to shreds, an idea that Deleuze and Guattri actually touch on in A Thousand Plateaus. Associating these concepts with the name diagrammatism, as he says, we don't consolidate ourselves with diagrammatism. We don't get rid of the black hole with a little spoon, or, like with a boat, a baler. It's on this note that I'd like to conclude, trying to make this not too long of a video. So far, we've looked at the taxonomy of problems, their ethology, some of the dynamics of abstract machines, and, to an extent, the ways in which black holes function. With our next video on the seminar, we'll continue on this path with an analysis of The Shining, particularly the film directed by Stanley Kubrick. However, that's for another day. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong, or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments, so I can do better. Next time, we'll likely be finally doing an episode on character analysis by Willem Reich. Until then, bye!